where I'm speaking tonight. I'm Carolyn Music, Chair of Christian Thought in the Department of Classics and Religion at the University of Calgary. Now, before we start the presentation tonight, I would like to go over some basic points related to the format of tonight's talk. We have 60 minutes for tonight's webinar. And in uh, about 25 minutes into the presentation, we will stop and take some questions and um, for about five to 10 minutes. And then after that, uh, the presentation will proceed. And if there's time for more questions at the end, we will take some more questions. Now, as this is a webinar, the method for you to ask questions is to type them into the Q&A box that you should see at the bottom of your screen. So if you touch your screen with your cursor and click on your Q&A box, that's where you'll, you'll be able to type in your questions. So do type in your questions as and when they occur to you. Uh, only the speaker, chair, and technicians can see your questions. Monique, one of our technical assistants will read out the questions. The present, and I apologize in advance if we are not able to get to all the questions, so we will try our best. The presentation is being recorded and it will be uploaded onto the Chair of Christian Thought YouTube, YouTube station. Yes, there is a Chair of Christian Thought YouTube station, just in case you weren't aware. Because you are registered for this event, you will automatically receive a link to the recording once it is available. So we will now officially start tonight's event. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising Sisika, Pikani, and Ganai First Nations, as well as the Sutina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Shiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to Metis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. As I previously mentioned, I am Carolyn Music, Chair of Christian Thought in the Department of Classics and Religion, University of Calgary. It is my pleasure to warmly welcome you, the audience, to hear tonight's speaker, Professor Bernard McGinn. Professor McGinn is Naomi Shenstone Donnelly Professor Emeritus of Historical Theology and the History of Christianity in the Divinity School at the University of Chicago. Professor McGinn's many books include Antichrist, 2000 Years of the Human Fascination with Evil, and Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologiae, a biography. One of the few benefits of lockdown is that this time has allowed Professor McGinn to finish his long range project of a seven volume history of mysticism. Titles in this multi-volume history of the Western Christian mystical tradition include, and I'm sure you're all very familiar with them, The Foundations of Mysticism, The Harvest of Mysticism in Medieval Germany, and Mysticism in the Golden Age of Spain. Now, in addition to being the scholar of the highest distinction, Professor McGinn is an outstanding teacher. I know this firsthand from when he was a visiting professor at the University of Bristol in 2009, uh, when he was there for one month, uh, where I, I was previously uh, taught at the University of Bristol before coming to Calgary. Professor McGinn, during this time, gave a series of lectures and master classes uh, on Christian history and mysticism, and they were packed out not only with students, but with faculty. He was, a, he was generous with his time, uh, in and out of the classroom and gave guidance to many of our undergraduates, MA and PhD students. Now, it's unfortunate that we and our students at Calgary cannot benefit from Professor McGinn's expertise in person, but we are lucky that he will give a series of three virtual talks this week, sponsored by the Department of Classics and Religion, University of Calgary. On Friday, he will speak on the compassion of the mystics, on Saturday, he will give the Endowed Chair of Christian Thought Swanson Lecture uh, in, on Christian spirituality and examine the question, what is mysticism? I know no better person who can answer that question. If you would like to find out more about these presentations, please visit the website of the Department of Classics and Religion, University of Calgary. There you will find the full details under events. 
Tonight, Professor McGinn will give the first of his three talks and speak on perspectives on prayer from Meister Eckhart and Julian of Norwich. Professor McGinn, thank you so much for accepting our invitation and welcome to the University of Calgary. Thank you so much, Carolyn. And I'm very happy to be in Calgary, uh, even if only virtually, because I've not been there before. And I want to thank the whole audience, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for uh, uh, your interest in this kind of topic. It's something that's very close to, uh, to my own heart. So I was happy to be able to have this opportunity. So what I'm going to talk about, firstly, is just to set out a few details about the nature of prayer and the foundation of prayer in, in Christian mysticism. And then I want to concentrate on two of the really major figures in the history of mysticism and what they what they tell us about prayer. First of all, Meister Eckhart, and I'll talk about 20 minutes or so about Eckhart and then try to allow some time for questions, and then about uh, Julian of Norwich. But I felt it was good to start with a, a little bit of introduction because prayer is integral to uh, Christianity in general and also to Christian mysticism. And two things are very important, I think, to understand. First is the role of prayer in the New Testament prayer in the life of Jesus, and prayer in the other New Testament documents. And then secondly is what I call the entry of contemplative prayer into early Christianity, which is partly due to uh, the influence of Greek thought in the second and third century. But uh, as many of you know, who've read your New Testament very carefully, Jesus is portrayed in the Gospels as one who prays. He prays Jewish liturgical prayer at the Last Supper, he engages in public prayer, both the Lord's prayer that he teaches to the disciples and the priestly prayer portrayed in the 17th chapter of John. But he's also uh, described over and over again in the New Testament text as privately praying to his father. I'll quote just one text, Matthew 14, 23. After he dismissed the crowds, Jesus went up the mountain by himself to pray. Now, there are dozens of texts in the, uh, in the Synoptic Gospels that talk about Jesus praying privately to his father. We don't know exactly what this private prayer was, but I think it establishes the importance of private prayer in the whole history of Christianity. But later in the New Testament, particularly in the epistles, there are key texts about prayer that become essential to the whole history of the development of thought about prayer, theology about prayer in the later Christian tradition over 2000 years. And I'd like to focus on, mention just two of these because they're so significant. They both come from the Pauline literature. In 1 Thessalonians chapter five, Paul says to the Thessalonians, rejoice always praying without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Jesus Christ for you. Praying without ceasing. And in Luke 18, Jesus also tells a parable in which he tells people they need to pray always. So Christians are supposed to pray always, but how do you pray always? So many theologians, mystics, and others have uh, taken up that text and say, how can we pray always? The second text comes from the first epistle of Timothy, in which Paul or pseudo Paul talks about four kinds of prayer. Uh, quote, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone. Now, again, that's four different kinds of prayer. What's the difference? What, what do they involve? And a lot of the theology of prayer is engaged with trying to sort that out. The point is that there's a history of theology of prayer built into the, the, uh, the, the New Testament, starting in the New Testament, then percolating throughout the history of Christian thought. And among the people who talked most about prayer, of course, were the great Christian mystics. And some of them, especially Meister Eckhart and Julian, which is why I uh, singled them out, uh, are not only very, very popular mystics, still very widely read today, but they have remarkable insights and they also have very challenging insights. 
they tell us things about prayer that we really haven't heard about for the most part, and that often are surprising. So how can we put them and their teaching into the proper context? So I'm going to start with Eckhart, and I'll just give you all a very brief uh, background to, uh, to Meister Eckhart, who lived primarily in the 13th century. He was a Dominican friar, born about uh, 1260 in Saxony in Germany, entered the Dominican mendicant order uh, as a young man at Erfurt, studied uh, there, and then went on to the Dominican House of Studies, the major house of studies in Germany, the Studium Generale in Cologne. Then because he was a smart young guy, he was sent to, um, sent to Paris, the Center of Theological Studies, where he spent a number of years, probably five or six years, studying theology and was eventually awarded the degree of <clears throat> Magister Theologiae, Doctor of Theology. Then he's sent back to Germany to Erfurt, where he begins his writing career in the 1290s, gives some talks to his friars there, the talks of instruction. And then he's chosen because of his tremendous skill as a theologian to be promoted back to Paris. This is 1302, 1303, to become the Dominican regent master, they're called, the Dominican chief master of theology at Paris, where he begins his theological academic Latin writing career. These never lasted for long. They cycled people through that. So then he's sent back to Germany again for a period of a, a, a number of years, probably about 10 or 12. Very unusually, he's then sent back to Paris a second time for what's called a second regency. Only Thomas Aquinas prior to him had been given that uh, kind of privilege. So he teaches there again for a year, again, working on his Latin works. And then he spends about 10 years in Strasbourg, uh, primarily in pastoral work, preaching in the vernacular, giving counsel to Dominican nuns and beggings and various others. And many of his sermons date, date from that period. As an older man, 1324, 26 or so, he sent back to Cologne where he had once studied as a young man. And, uh, you know, it was probably mostly preaching. Then a remarkable thing happens. In 1326, Eckhart is accused of heresy, not by Dominicans, but by enemies of the order, who take out a large series of excerpts from his writings and sermons, both vernacular sermons in German, because he worked in both, and they say these are heretical. Eckhart defends himself in 1326 in September. And then because the Dominicans are an exempt order, he appeals to the Pope, he says, let the Pope decide this issue. So he goes to Avignon, where Pope John the 22nd was then reigning and he does defend himself and we have documents that, uh, you know, that uh, speak to that kind of defense. At that stage, he dies, probably in early 1328. And, and this is important for where I'm gonna start, the Pope John the 22nd, about a year later, in March 27, 1329, issues a papal document, a bull called Inagro Dominico in the field of the Lord, which condemns 26 propositions or articles taken from Eckhart's writings, some as heretical, some as only dangerous. But he doesn't condemn Eckhart as a heretic. He says that Eckhart had retracted these points insofar as they might lead people astray. Now, the point about this is that Eckhart then comes down to history as a kind of controversial figure, not condemned as a heretic, but some of what he said was deemed dangerous or, or heretical. And that's where I'm gonna start and because Article 7 of that papal bull in Agro Dominico specifically addresses prayer. I'm not gonna read Article 7. It's taken from Eckhart's commentary on John. <clears throat> he who prays for anything particular, prays badly and for something that is bad because he is praying for the negation of the good and the negation of God. And he begs that God be denied him. So he who prays for anything particular, the Latin is this and that. He who prays for this or that 
is praying badly. And the Pope says, uh, uh, <clears throat> that's heretical. Eckhart's against prayer. Now there are lots of sermons, the German sermons and others where Eckhart says the same thing. Let me read you a couple of passages here. German sermon 67. Those who pray for anything but God or do with God pray wrongly. When I pray for nothing, then I pray rightly. And that prayer is proper and powerful. But if anyone prays for anything else, he's praying to a false God, one might say that this is sheer heresy. I never pray so well as when I pray for nothing and nobody. Uh oh. Nothing and nobody. Sermon German, uh, German Sermon 26. Alas, how many people there are who worship a shoe or a cow and encumber themselves with them? They are fools. As soon as you pray to God for creatures, you pray for your own harm. For a creature is no sooner a creature than it bears within itself bitterness and trouble, evil and distress. So they get their just desserts, those people who reap distress and bitterness. Why? They prayed for it. So don't pray for a new cow or a new set of shoes. You're not praying correctly. So Eckhart seems to criticize the usual kind of prayer, what we call the prayer of petition, asking for anything. And yet, Eckhart believes prayer is central to the Christian life. In one of his Latin sermons, he has both Latin and German sermons, this is Latin Sermon 47, he talks uh, about the usefulness and need for prayer, and he describes nine different points about it. I won't read out these nine points, but he gives a definition of prayer that I think is a wonderful definition. Prayer is having a conversation with God. And it much delights those in love to talk to each other familiarly and in secret. The Latin is oratio es cum deo confabulatio, sitting down and having a, a conversation with God. So how do you put together Eckhart's praise of prayer as confabulatio cum deo, having a conversation with God, and his condemnation of praying for something, praying for particular things, Praying for a cow, praying for a shoe. Well, I think that moves us back into the whole of Eckhart's theology, in a sense, his mystical theology. His mystical theology, which is based upon the necessity of what he called letting go and detaching, freeing ourselves from attachments, attachments to creatures, attachments to ourselves, even attachments to God, when we conceive of God as a kind of great reward machine in the sky, you know, you put in your coins and the reward comes down at the bottom of the thing and you get your little candy bar or whatever it would be. For Eckhart, if you have that kind of attachment to things or to ourselves or even to God conceived of in the incorrect way, you're bound to pray wrongly. You're praying with attachment. And when Eckhart criticizes petitionary prayer in those passages I read out, he's really criticizing a prayer that's attached, attached primarily to our own wishes, but also attached to things. So prayer, therefore, for Eckhart, if it's going to be true prayer, has to renounce all attachment. It has to give up wanting this or that for ourselves. It has to instead want nothing else but God. And Eckhart, I think, makes this very clear in a number of his sermons, uh, Sermon 1, for example, and Sermon 2. And this is well put uh, by the German Eckhart scholar, Freimut Löser, and a wonderful article he wrote on the prayer in Eckhart. Let me just quote you one passage from Löser's article. The prayer that Eckhart wants must be without attachment, and it must not become a business arrangement with God. Nor take a person away from inner rest. It must ask nothing else from God than God himself. So a prayer that's a business attachment. You know, I'll pray for this if you give me that. From Eckhart's point of view, that's the prayer that's bad. And that's praying badly. 
And this is quite clear from a number of different places in Eckhart's writings. Again, I'll quote just uh, one of these councils of discernment. These were the uh, pieces of advice he gave to the, his Franciscan uh, brothers in the 1290s. And uh, number two of the councils uh, is uh, uh, entitled The Most Powerful Prayer and the Highest Work of All. I quote, the most powerful prayer and the strongest of all to obtain everything is that which proceeds from an empty spirit. The emptier the spirit, the more is the prayer and the work, mighty, worthy, profitable, praiseworthy, perfect. The empty spirit can do everything. The empty spirit is one that is confused by nothing, attached to nothing. For it is all sunk deep down in God's dearest will and has forsaken its own. We ought to pray so powerfully that we should like to put our every member and strength, our two eyes and ears, mouth, heart, all our senses to work. And we should not give up until we find what that we wish to be one with him who is present in us and whom we entreat, that is God. So for Eckhart, prayer is very important and it's very powerful, but it has to be done in the right, in, in, from the right perspective. But, but still you might say, well, Eckhart seems to have no place for petitionary prayer, asking God for something. Is there still room for asking God if it's done from the right attitude, that is from, a, from an empty spirit? And there I think there is, and we can find you know, evidence of that in various writings of Eckhart. And there's a treatise called On Detachment, whether it was written by Eckhart or one of his near disciples, we're not quite sure. The scholars differ on this, but I think it's certainly Eckhartian in a broad sense. And in that treatise on detachment, the author, Eckhart, I say, says all the prayers and good works that a person can accomplish in time move God's detachment as little as if no single prayer or good work were ever performed in time. Well, that might makes it sound like prayer is useless. But then Eckhart goes on to say, and yet for this, God is never less gentle or any less inclined toward a person than if he had never performed prayer or good works. And I think the secret for understanding this is that from God's perspective, there is no time. We can't pray for something in the future. For God, the future is here. So we must pray in the divine now in which God is present and which the future is present. And Eckhart says in God's first everlasting glance, which is the now of eternity, our time and all future time and all past time, God also saw the smallest prayer and good work that anyone would ever perform. And he took into his regard which prayers and devotion he would give ear to. Hence, the, the mistake is thinking that we can change God's eternal plan. When we pray, even from the viewpoint of petition, we really are praying to be one with God's will, which is eternally revealed in the present. So Eckhart concludes, God remains in his immovable detachment, and yet man's prayers and good works are not on this account wasted. For whoever does well will also be well rewarded. And whoever does evil will be rewarded accordingly. Later in that same treatise on detachment, Eckhart has another revealing passage on the prayer of the heart that has detachment. Once again, he starts by seeming to deny the usefulness of prayer. But then, and this is typical for Eckhart, he turns the denial kind of inside out to reveal the true nature of prayer. And again, I'll quote this, uh, this passage. I say that purity and detachment does not know how to pray. Because if someone prays, he asks God to get something from him. Or he asks God to take something away from him. But a heart and detachment asks for nothing. Nor has it anything of which it would gladly be free. So it is free of all prayer. And its prayer is its uniformity with God. Well, that's an interesting, it's free of all prayer. 
that his prayer is praying for particularity, but its prayer is expressing its oneness with God. Towards the end of this passage, he gives expression to one of his finest passages on the meaning of what, what is pure detachment. Well, pure detachment is when something ascends to the highest place, the spirit. It knows nothing of knowing it, loves nothing of loving it. From light, it becomes dark. This, Eckhart says, is true poverty of spirit. And interestingly enough, to, uh, to go back to the condemned article that I started with, Article 7, if we look at that, then it's occurrence at the end of his long commentary on John, Eckhart explains the, uh, the, the paragraph. And he goes on to say, every devout person praying to God should pray this alone. May the will of God be done, or what God wants. Not this or the other thing, or this and the other thing indifferently or without distinction. It should not be this more than that, or may this rather be done than not done, or that one would rather receive something than not receive it. Let it be that God wishes this or that, whether to give it or not to give. And it's a person who prays like this receives by not receiving, and so consequently always gets everything he asks for. And if you think about it, this conforms with what we pray when we pray the Our Father. Thy will be done, not our will. And those of you who are familiar with other spiritual writers, I'm thinking of Ignatius spiritual exercises, will recognize that this is much like the Jesuits' notion of, of indifference. And in some sermons, Eckhart actually uh, comments on that phrase from the uh, Lord's Prayer, fiat voluntas tua, let thy will be done. And this is what he says about it. This is German Sermon 30. Yesterday, I sat in a certain place and quoted a text from the Lord's Prayer, which is, thy will be done. But it would be better to say, let will be thine. Let will be thine. For what the Lord's Prayer means is that my will should become his, that I should become he. So the, the real prayer, let thy will be done, is let my will be your will. And I think that's what, what Eckhart is trying to, uh, to put across. Now, I want to take just a couple more minutes uh, about, uh, about Eckhart. Eckhart's prayer practice is evident also throughout his writings and particularly in his sermons. Eckhart often closes his sermons with, um, with a brief prayer. And those of, who read, those of us who read through these sermons are often very, very difficult to understand, sometimes tend to dismiss these prayers. There are only a few lines at, at the end of each sermon, but I think that's a mistake. If you look at them carefully, each of these prayers at the end of the sermons it's a very succinct attempt to summarize the message of the sermon and to ask God that this message might be realized in us. For example, and I'm just going to give one here. Sermon number, number six, uh, German sermon six, talks about justice. And Eckhart gives a very original theory of justice here, which I won't go into. Uh, complicated, original. But at the very end of the sermon, he says that we may love justice for its own sake and for God, without asking for return, may God help us to this, amen. That's very typical, sermon after sermon after sermon. Furthermore, we have at least a few, a handful of vernacular sermons that Eckhart seems to compose himself and that come down to us in the later uh, Eckhart literature. Uh, again, Freimut Lerzer's article that I referred to earlier studies some of these and argues that even though they're not, they don't come down in Eckhart's sermons, they actually go back to Eckhart's teaching. And one of these, I think, is, I would say, is a perfect summation of Eckhart's teaching on prayer. And I want you to note it includes both thanksgiving and petition but very much within an overall context 
of the mysticism of detachment, getting rid of our attachments, letting go of the self, cutting ourselves off from things, releasing the self. This is the prayer. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that you have given us your only begotten Son, in whom you give yourself in all things. We ask you, Heavenly Father, that just as you have given us your only begotten Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom and in whom you neither will nor can nor may deny anyone anything, so may you hear us in him and make us free and empty of our many faults and make us one with him in you. So note you start off with thanksgiving for God's greatest gift, the incarnation. But then you go on to petition. But it's the deep petition. It's not asking for this or that. It's asking that our oneness in Christ with the Father will be realized. So I think that's the heart of Eckhart's uh, theology of prayer. And I'm going to stop there and see if we have Okay, great, Bernie. Thank you so much. We'll take a, a pause there. And I believe there are four questions and Monique is kindly going to uh, read them out for us. Right. So our first one here for you, Bernard, is how does Eckert speak about the prayer Jesus taught, the Our Father that seems to have petitions, give us today our daily bread, etc.? Yeah, that's a very, uh, Eckhart actually has an early uh, Latin commentary on the Our Father, one of his first works written in the 1290s. And I would not say it's one of his most original works. But later in his vernacular works, and I've quoted one or two sermons here, and there's a long passage from his Book of Consolation, Eckhart gives a, not a full commentary, but a commentary on various parts of uh, the Our Father. And what he does, as I tried to show in that one a text where I cited, what he, what he tries to do is turn it on his head. Thy will be done. For him, as he puts it here, is let will be thine. Let our will become yours. So it right away moves, a, moves us back into God and the divine perspective. So Eckhart, uh, praise the Our Father, he says, in, in one of those sermons, you know, he was praying as our father and suddenly he had a new insight into one of the petitions. And the petition was to put everything back in God, not thy will be done, but let my will be perfectly conformed with your will. So I think Eckhart, I mean, I, I could give a talk on, on Eckhart as a commentator on the, uh, <laughs> on the our father and by putting together bits and pieces from, uh, from his later vernacular works. But I think his understanding of the Our Father would not be <clears throat> what a lot of people currently understand. Is that helpful to the... That's, that's great, <laughs> Bernie. Yes, great. Uh, Monique, uh, the next question. All right, so another one here. Someone's wondering if whether they heard correctly that a good prayer would be one asking to be one with God. Exactly. That's the, uh, the foundation of prayer for Eckhart. If you are one with God, then you will pray in the correct way. If you're thinking only of yourself and your attachments and what you need, I need this and I need that, you pray badly. But if your prayer starts from the fact that you are expressing your oneness with God and your conformity with divine will, that your will has become God's will, then, that, then your prayer, even your petitionary prayer, would be a perfectly fine prayer. Just as that prayer I cited just at the end there, it has a thanksgiving and it has a petition. <laughs> but it doesn't petition, oh, I want this, or, God, please give me that. It petitions for the most important thing of all, that is oneness with God and freeness, freedom for our sin. Great. Yeah, okay. So we have another one here. Do you see any carryover from Eckhart in the Reformation, Reformation concept of the believer not being able to do anything that would affect their own salvation, not even responding to God's leading? Um, well, that's a very interesting question because uh, 
Eckhart certainly had an influence on some of the reformers. And we're learning more about that uh, today. But we can't e exaggerate that. I think there's a tremendous difference between Eckhart's theology there in the early part of the 14th century and the theology of, uh, of Luther and the other reformers. Certain of the reformers, uh, uh, Luther himself was very much influenced by Tauler, but he read some Eckhart sermons. Certain later Lutherans, and I'm thinking of Johann Arndt and uh, people like um, you know, Valentin Weigel and others are very influenced by, by Eckhart. I, I do, I would make a difference between what was expressed in that question about not being able to do anything. Eckhart puts everything in God and God's initiative, but he still will stress a certain level of cooperation in us that perhaps not all the reformers are going to be willing to do. That's a short answer to a complicated, complicated issue. All right, do we have time for one more, Carolyn? Um, uh, see, Bernie, we're, we're uh, it's almost 20 to eight. So maybe uh, one more uh, question. Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick. Okay, so maybe, no, that's okay. It's not, not that, it's that there's so many good questions, but uh, we have to hear a bit about Julian of Norwich as well. We I'll just pipe in here. Um, there's one here about, was Eckhart impacted by Eastern religious traditions? because his teaching on detachment seems to have much overlap with Buddhism. That too is a very interesting question. Eckhart himself was not impacted by Eastern religious traditions. He knew nothing about them. That there are great similarities between Eckhart and some Eastern traditions, particularly Buddhism is certainly true. And there's a big literature about that, but it didn't come from historical influence. It came from the depths of the Buddhist and Eckhartian meditations upon the divine nature, detachment, freedom, etc. Thank you so much. Okay, well, I think um, what we'll do is we'll, um, we'll go on to Julian of Norwich and maybe if we're, if we're lucky, we'll have a few minutes for discussion. Is that okay? That's fine with me. Okay, wonderful. Take it away. Okay, so Julian of Norwich may be better known uh, to many of you uh, her dates are roughly 1342 to, we don't know when she died, <clears throat> 1417, 1420. And a lot has been written about Julian, uh, and particularly Julian on prayer. Now, the story about Julian is well known. And she tells us at age 31 and a half, precisely May 13, 17, 1373, pious woman, Julian, probably not yet an anchoress, had what we would call a near-death experience in which he was given 16 vivid revelations, showings of Christ's passion. And after what seemed like a miraculous recovery, she wrote an account of these showings and her interpretation of them, the so-called short text. We now call it a vision showed by the goodness of God to a devout woman. This is pretty short, it's 25 chapters, 11,000 words. But Julian, at some stage, having become an anchoress at an enclosed woman living in a cell next to the church of St. Julian in March, continued to meditate and pray on the meaning of the showings. And over what must have been several decades, 20 or 30 years, she composed a much longer account called the Long Text, or today we call the Revelation of Love, great title. And this was 86 chapters, about 63,000 words. Now these two texts survive in only a few manuscripts and indeed were largely forgotten. They were read by a few English Catholics in the 17th century, but they're really forgotten until the late 19th century, they rediscovered. In the early 20th century, editions are made, translations are made, and Julian of Arch becomes one of the most read of all Christian mystics. There are translations into almost uh, dozens of languages. There are many editions and many, many people read and treasure increasingly Julian and scores of books every year, believe me, are written on Julian of Norwich. Now, how to put this theology together in the two texts, et cetera. Well, my uh, phrase I use for that is 
Julian's theology, she's a mystic and a theologian, is integrative. She integrates aspects, all the aspects of Christian belief, fits them together into a remarkable harmony. That's really her own creation. She's not a trained theologian. She's not a scholastic theologian. She's an independent theologian. She's a vernacular theologian writing in Middle English. The center of the, her theology is easy to identify, but its many ramifications and extraordinary depths is, is diffi are difficult. In the final chapter of the long text, chapter 86, she says that for over 15 years, she had asked the Lord to know the meaning in this thing, that is the revelations. The answer was given her in her spiritual understanding. And she says it was this, a message from God. Know it well, love was his meaning. Who reveals it to you? Love. What did he reveal to you? Love. Why does he reveal it to you? For love. Remain in this and you will know more of the same. So the central meaning of everything that Julian says in these two texts is really, the, is really love. The love that she, in another chapter, early chapter, chapter 84, describes as it comprising three kinds of love or charity. What she calls charity unmade, charity made, charity given. That is the uncreated charity that is God the created charity that is our soul made by God and the given charity that is the gift of grace and deeds in which we love God for himself and ourselves in God and all that God loves for God. Now among these deeds, the gift of grace and deeds is the activity of prayer by which we relate to charity unmade to God. We express the depth of our own charity made ourselves and we exercise the charity given by Christ, the grace that comes in the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> excuse me, prayer is an integral part of all of the revelations. And indeed, I mentioned there were 16 revelations. Revelation 14 out of the 16 is explicitly about prayer. And she describes this both in the short text in chapter 19 and then re-describes it in a longer form in the long text in chapters 41 and 43. Now, these are not the only passages about prayer in Julian's wonderful text, but these are the central texts because these are revelations given about prayer and they're revelations given through God speaking to her, not through the actual vision of the, uh, of the passion. The earlier <clears throat> revelations come with the vision of the passion. Revelation 14 comes in a speech that comes from God. <clears throat> so I want to analyze, uh, starting with the short text in chapter 19, uh, and then say a little bit more about the longer text. The teaching is basically the same. There's expansion in the long text. The long text takes about 12 or 15 pages. The short text is only three or four. The teaching is basically the same. And so the short text. After this, our Lord showed me about prayer. I'm reading here. In which showing I saw two conditions in those who pray, two conditions, characteristics, we could say. One condition is that they will not pray for anything at all, that is anything at random, but only for what God, for what is God's will and worship. Now that's much like Meister Eckhart. You don't pray for hawk at hawk. You don't pray for this or that. You don't pray for anything at all but you pray only for what's God's will and God's worship, that is his glory. The second condition is that they apply themselves mightily and continually to beseech, beseeka, beseech what is his will and his worship. So you've got to pray for what's God's will and then you've got to really work at it, that you're beseeching. These two characteristics are explained in accordance with the teaching of Holy Church. To pray in the right way is to pray only for things that are in accordance with God's will and worship. We might say that's, let your will be done, the voluntas tua. Secondly, our, our beseeching must be strong and unrelenting. That's what the long text speaks of as praying with sure trust, sacred trust. 
Julian also emphasizes the corporate character of prayer. It was immediately after this, she says, thus we pray for all our even Christians, our fellow Christians, and for all manner of people that God's will be done. For we would that all manner of men and women are in the same virtue and grace that we desire for ourselves. So we pray for others as we pray for ourselves. Nonetheless, prayer is not easy because Julian goes on to say that prayer is something hard. It's hard for three reasons. First, because we doubt that God's he God hears us. Does he really listen? Second, we sense our own unworthiness. Are we worthy to pray to God? And finally, because we're frequently experiencing dryness in praying. We don't feel like it means anything. It's not, it's not important. Why should I pray? And Julian says, you know, quite openly, she's experienced all of these, as indeed I think anybody who's ever prayed. We reflect on our own prayer practice. Is God hearing us? Are we worthy to pray to God? Oh my God, you know, this is so dry, so empty. Seems so useless to be praying. But this is where Julian's teaching on prayer and the difficulties of praying, I think, takes a very original turn. Because she says that the Lord, as she was thinking about this, gave her great strength to continue praying in her trial. And then he says to her, and I quote again, God says to her, I am the ground of thy beseeking. I am the ground of thy beseeking. That is, I am the ground or foundation of your beseeching. First, it is my will that you should have it, the beseeching. Then I make you wish for it. You want to pray. And then I make you beseech it and you ask for it. How could it then be that you would not have what you beseech? So if God is causing our prayer, how can it not reach its fulfillment? In this wonderful phrase, Julian recenters prayer in God not in ourselves. God is the ground of our beseeching. If we think only of ourselves, we're thinking, oh, no, prayer is no good. I, I, I can't do it. But if we think prayer is something that God does in us, no matter how difficult it seems, we have a very different perspective. We're not performing prayer ourselves. When we pray even badly, God is performing prayer in us. God is the ground of our beseeching. Now, Julian's beseeching, beseeking it, is obviously what the long monastic tradition would call the prayer of oratio. That is primarily a form of petitionary, intercessory prayer. We ask for something from God. And prayer has always had this, this central aspect. Nonetheless, I think what both Julian and Eckhart are asking us to do is give more thought to what petition really means. And I think they would agree that there's a difference between asking God for something and asking God for God. If we put asking God for God first, then we can properly ask for something. But if we put asking God for something, this or that, first, our prayer is not going to make it. And Eckhart's criticisms will be quite clear. And by the way, <clears throat> This teaching is not just particular to, um, uh, to Eckhart or to Julian of Norwich. Thomas Aquinas, in his Compendium of Theology, uh, Book 2, Chapter 4, once said that prayer is the expression of the theological virtue of hope. And this hope is not directed to hope for particular things in the world, but for the eschatological reward of the beatific vision. That's the same message. Prayer is an expression of hope for the beatific vision. This is asking God for God. And not, but, and only secondarily asking God for something. So here I think with regard to prayer, as well as so much else in her theology, her doctrine of the fall, her doctrine of salvation, her doctrine of eschatology, Julian makes a real uh, theological breakthrough. She reverses things. 
Put prayer back in God. Don't put it in yourself. And thus, I think, according to Julian, we should not worry about how we pray or whether we're praying for the right thing. As long as we pray with the church, it is God who's praying in us. He's the ground, the foundation of our beseeching. Julian goes even further in this chapter. This is chapter 19. As he teaches that prayer is the source of our union with God. She says, prayer wants the soul to God. Prayer wants the soul to God. She distinguishes, as many mystics such as Teresa of Avila do, between two kinds of union. Although the soul is always like God in nature and substance, it is often unlike him in its condition through many kinds of sin. I'm quoting here. Prayer makes the soul like God when the soul wills what God wills, and then it is like God in condition as it is in nature. And thus he teaches us to pray and trust strongly that we shall have what we pray for. This, of course, is again, let your will be done, fiat voluntas tua. Like Eckhart, Julian says that everything that happens is based on God's eternal will and must happen as he determined. But by means of prayer, God makes us into his collaborators in bringing this all about. When we pray, the love of God is so powerful, she says, that he makes us partners in his good deed. In the final explanation of this uh, chapter, Julian takes a further step. And she moves from petitionary prayer, that's the beseeching, to contemplative prayer, what she calls beholding, beholding. Since prayer makes an accord between God and man's soul, when man is at ease with God, there is no need to pray, that is pray by supplication, but as Julian puts it, only behold reverently what he says. So behold or contemplate reverently what he says. So there is a prayer of beseeching, but it moves forward to a prayer of beholding where we behold or contemplate reverently what he says, and we don't need to make petition any further. And just a two minutes here, if you look at the uh, chapters 41 to 43, the long text, the core message remains the same. But I'd say there's some expansion in three important applications. The first one, Julian highlights the fact that all our prayer is part of Christ's prayer, which is given to us by the Holy Spirit. So prayer is always Christological. Here, Julian even gives a definition of prayer. She, said, she says, beseeching is a true, gracious, lasting will of the soul, one then fastened into the will of our Lord by the sweet, secret working of the Holy Spirit. Our Lord himself is the first receiver of our prayer. And he accepts it most thankfully. Thus, it is not our beseeching that is the cause of the good God sends us, but his own goodness working in us is the ground of prayer. Later on, she gives even a second, briefer definition of prayer in chapter 42. For prayer is right understanding of that fullness of joy which is to come with true longing and trust. Prayer is the right understanding of the fullness of joy, the heavenly joy, which is to come with true longing and trust. So <clears throat> prayer is Christological. And secondly, the second development in the long text is that the discussion in the short text touched primarily on petitionary prayer and contemplative prayer. But in the long, <clears throat> in the long text, Julian expands this to note that thanksgiving also pertains to prayer. She says, thanking is a true inward knowing with great reverence and lovely fear, turning ourselves as all powers toward the task God stirs in us that is enjoying and thinking inwardly. So prayer here has three characteristics, petition, thanksgiving, contemplation. And <clears throat> finally, excuse me, <clears throat> Julian says more about the relationship between prayer, petition, thanksgiving, and the prayer of vision and contemplation in which we are united to God. Here she emphasizes even more than in the short text that the whole reason for prayer is union with God. Through the effort of continuous prayer, Julian says that God will reward us at his own time and pleasure with moments of what we might call 
mystical consciousness, mystical experience. I quote, when we by his special grace plainly behold him, seeing no other, then we follow him and he draws us into himself by prayer. In this state, we can only behold him, enjoying him with a high, mighty desire to be all one with him. That is to become one with him. So the goal in the long text emphasizes union even more strongly than the exposition in the short text. So I think if you read, these texts are not long. And if you have access to Julian's revelations in both texts, read them and meditate on them you'll find a tremendously powerful doctrine of prayer that I think shows very interesting similarities with, uh, with Eckhart and really gives us a very different insight on what we're doing when we pray. As long as we remember, God is the ground of our beseeching. Thank you so much, Bernie, that's wonderful. We have questions, uh, unsurprisingly, um, <laughs> that we can um, maybe almost get through we'll see uh monique would you like to read the first one please of course all right so the first one here is from george you say that julian is a vernacular theologian because she wrote in english i think you said eckhart wrote in german as well as latin so i have two questions one is vernacular theology different from other forms of theology and two can eckhart also be termed a vernacular theologian yeah, I, I do think vernacular theology is different. I, I divide medieval theology into three basic categories. Monastic theology, which is a long tradition. Scholastic theology, which rose in the 12th century and continued. And then primarily in the 13th century on the vernacular theology, which not only has a different language framework, but which also comes out of a different educational background, it includes much more possibility for women writing in vernacular theology much more difficult to characterize because vernacular theologies in the plural would be the better, the better way to put it. Uh, <clears throat> Julian Narch is certainly a vernacular theologian, as many others are. Eckhart is an interesting case because in Eckhart we have a conversation between the technical scholastic theology and the new German vernacular theology. So there's a conversation between the two sides of Eckhart. But I do think that one side of him, the German sermons can be called vernacular theology, but it's in a kind of conversation with the learned scholastic theology that makes Eckhart such a particularly interesting figure to uh, this study. I've, writ <clears throat> I've written about this, Nicholas Watson, who studies Julian of Norwich and other, has also written about this. I think there's a general recognition today of the category of vernacular theology as significant to our understanding of the Middle Ages. All right, so uh, our next question here. What was the type of prayer of the common folk in the time of Eckhart and Julian? If everyone can be a mystic, and she doesn't remember who wrote that, then there has to be a way to train for that. Right. Well, the common people, of course, prayed the ordinary prayers uh, uh, of, of Christian religion, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Creed, as we would call them. And often were, you know, were, uh, you know, were not literary skilled in any kind of way. Eckhart is preaching to these people. He's not preaching just to the learned. And that's a remarkable thing when you think about it. Today we find Eckhart's sermons, you know, extremely difficult to understand. His sermons are very popular with these people, unlearned people we would call them today. And they, what you can often see is when he comments on the Our Father and other things that. He's trying to uh, teach them the deep meaning of the prayers that they pray every day. And we know his sermons are extremely popular despite their difficulty. So I think that, you know, our modern perspective is uh, these medieval peasants and, you know, workers in the towns, they had to be pretty stupid people that never went to school. I think they were extremely clever people and very deep people in many, in many ways who could appreciate, maybe not fully, but I could appreciate the message that, that Eckhart was given. Great. I think we have time for just one more quick question, Monique. Okay. So this is from an anonymous attendee. I hear echoes of Paul about the spirit interceding in groans when we do not know how to pray. 
Does the spirit come into either Julian or Eckhart? Very, very, very strongly so. I mean, they're they're quite conscious. I didn't perhaps touch on this as much as I, I could have in a, in a, in a short uh, talk. But I think they're very, very conscious of the fact that we pray in the spirit. And I think I, I did mention that in terms of at least of, uh, of Julian of Narge. And a particular Pauline text is cited uh, certainly by Eckhart and I'm fairly sure also, also by Eckhart. So, you know, the, the, the recognition is that if God is the ground of our beseeching, it's God praying us, praying in us through the Holy Spirit, the gift poured out in our hearts, Romans 5, 5. So the Pauline base, excuse me, the Pauline basis is very strong and it's thankful to, uh, uh, thanks for asking, asking that question. Great. Well, that's, I think, a, a, a lovely note to, to end on, uh, a, a wonderful uh, presentation of the power of prayer uh, then and now. And thank you so much, Professor McGinn, uh, for your paper. And thank you so much uh, to the audience for spectacular questions. Thank, thank you, you, Monique. Yes. And thank you, Monique, for reading uh, out the questions and Courtney for excellent technical hosting. Uh, we're completely out of time. Uh, good night, everyone. We hope to see you all on Friday when Professor McGinn continues with the compassion of the mystics. Good night and thank you, everyone. <laughs>